Right, so the next one from me is also from nature, rather um, ironically, I guess, rather hilariously. Yeah. Ironically, it's not quite the right word. Um, I've just found out that it actually appears on the cover of nature, so a number of our listeners will have probably already come across this, but this is seriously cool in the nanotech field. This is an electrically driven car that is a few atoms across. It's a four-wheel drive car that is driven by... Um, essentially rolling a scanning electron microscope over the top. It's seriously cute. This is this has been created by um, a bunch of different groups from across Europe, uh, mostly from the Netherlands and from Switzerland. And uh, they start off in this paper by noting that there's all sorts of wonderful nanomachines, as they're called in nature. We are full of them, uh, animals are full of them, plants are full of them, everything living is full of nanomachines. But what you get with most of them, what most of them is that, like for instance, the nanomachine, for instance, the nanomachines that are within our muscles, is they have very specific tracks that they slide along, and they're only able to do a very, very limited set of things. So what these guys did is they decided they wanted to build a car, not just any car, but a car that could ha quite happily drive itself on the nano scale. So that's exactly what they did. You can um, you can go to nature and you can have a look at this particular uh, the structure of this particular car, and it's very very cool. It's only a few carbon atoms. Um, and it's essentially a four-wheel drive. So it's made up of a whole bunch of, of ring molecules, benzene for the chemists amongst you. Well, <laughs> benzene rings at any rate. Uh, it's a mix of benzene and uh, five-membered rings. But essentially what happens is there are four wheels to this car. Uh, you put your electron microscope over the top and you allow electrons to tunnel through the molecule itself. And if you allow them to tunnel through one wheel, just like driving only one wheel on a car, this little car will turn itself. If you push the electron uh, microscope into the center of the molecule, all four wheels turn at once and it goes forward in a straight line. <laughs> if you put it at the front, it does something different if you, than if you put it at the back. And they've actually got little pictures, little um, little atomic force microscopy, I think. No, sorry. This is um, scanning tunneling microscope ah. images of this thing driving across a perfectly flat surface of copper. And it is just really cool because we don't have that many nanomachines synthetically made. There's one that was announced uh, earlier this year, I think it was, mm. that uh, acts like a wee little torpedo and it acts as a little um, DNA sampler. It's just a torpedo that flies around a solution. But this is the only other one that I've actually seen that looks anything like like a macro world thing, like a car. And this one just <laughs> works exactly like a car. It has the cutest misshapen wheels. They're not circular at all. They're actually shaped more like a, a giant um, thin letter X, if you can, can kind of imagine it. So how the car drives is very, very strange. <laughs> um, but it works. And you can get really specific directions and really specific movements just by studying how this car moves. Wow. Pretty cool. Do they have any sort of applications or anything for it, or was this mostly proof of concept? This is blue sky research as far as I'm aware. <laughs> um, I, d I don't see any immediate applications, and on my quick skim through the article, they don't seem to mention any straight off, but the kind of things that they would have had to develop with this, so I've unfortunately skimped on the details of how they actually get the wheels to turn, which is the really interesting part of this paper. Yeah. Um, that will have all sorts of implications in all sorts of other fields, uh, be it pure research or applied research. Absolutely. That level of control at that kind of size is always very exciting. Um, yeah. But of course, it also makes for the world's tiny scale electric sets, which is kind of cool too. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait for one. Someone's got to build one now. <laughs> yeah, put racing stripes on the side and flame flange out the back and <laughs> and who doesn't love scale electric i mean it's just awesome um next week on pimp my nano car <laughs> pretty much yeah can you imagine cool hey thank you off that's that's fantastic i i can imagine a whole bunch of people now will dutifully go and, and find out more about nano research just because it involves cars i i, I would hope so <laughs> but but first, grrr at nature for uh, for publishing that other article yeah grrr <laughs> at nature well hopefully they'll they'll we'll see what happens um about this. Uh, people people have moments sometimes, but then they need to say sorry as well. Um, all right. Uh, from that, I'm going to uh, chat a little bit about faster than light neutrinos um, again. So <laughs> some, uh, some weeks ago, there was a very exciting um, and very confusing result around some neutrinos and the speed at which they travel uh, out of opera, um, which is sort of 
involved with CERN, um, saying that neutrinos travel or, or the research that they had done and the data that they had gotten around some 15,000 neutrinos, I think it was, over about three years, suggested that these little buggers were traveling at about 60 nanoseconds faster than the speed of light, which caused an awful lot of a stir because um, the speed of light and the fact that it has an upper bounds is an intrinsic part of Einstein's theory of relativity, um, which explains an awful lot about what we think of the universe, has of course also been backed up a lot in experiment. Um, and is, is and things like the speed of light underpin causality, for example, which is the fact that, you know, uh, cause equals effect, well, cause then causes effect, and there's the arrow of time that only goes one way, so you can't go backwards in time. All of this kind of thing is linked in with the speed of light. So there was a great amount of hoo-ha. The scientists very responsibly said, look, this is our data. We're pretty sure something has gone wrong here. Um, we're not sure what, because we went and we had a look at everything and all the obvious errors that we could have made here, and we still don't know why we're getting these results. Please help us. So that and we should also note at this point that when they say these results, they're not talking about two or three oh. results. They're talking about thousands. Yes, it's, it's, I think it's about 15,000. It's, it's a stunning amount. Um, and, and the scientific community did just that. And so what's, what's going on is that um, the results are going to be replicated at other neutrino detectors. There are only a, a couple in the world because neutrinos are remarkably difficult to detect. They don't, they're what they call weakly interacting, which means they fly through just about anything. Um, but we've got a couple of other detectors out there. And if you, you, you know, the idea is that if you throw enough neutrinos at them, a couple stick. Um, she says paraphrasing enormously on that one. I don't think you're paraphrasing that much. I mean, one of them is the size of the Twin Towers buried in the ice in Antarctica, and the other one is a, an abandoned mine in Utah, if I remember correctly, yeah. full of cleaning fluid. So There's a couple. It, it, mm. it is a rather coarse-grained approach to detecting neutrinos, it, but that's, as you said, it's the only one that works. It really so. is. Well, we, we're not able to build, you know, thousands of kilometers tens of thousands a light years worth of lead in order to catch all of them. Um, perhaps we can use this new aerogel thing. Perhaps we can. <laughs> um, but but yes, and there's, so there's things like Super Kamiokan, uh, Super K in Japan, which is amazing. There are pictures of it on the internet. It looks like this huge room that has been covered in tiny golden Christmas baubles. Um, there's uh, Minos, there's a, there's a couple of them. So they're going to run similar experiments as well to see if they get the same kind of data. Um, and Opera, and the point of this story is that Opera has has rerun some of the experiments. Now, this isn't nearly as many neutrinos, of course, because they haven't had the same amount of time to do it. But what they did was um, one of the possible errors that was pointed out by people, or what could be doing it, was that the, um, the neutrinos for the previous results were fired in fairly long bursts. And so there was the thought that maybe the, some sort of jitter effect was, was kind of smearing things out. Uh, so they fired some more in very, very short bursts. And they found pretty much the same thing. So currently the research is still pointing towards neutrinos traveling faster than light. Um, everybody's kind of waiting for, for this to be disproven, that, that there has been an error of some kind made. But I also saw a very interesting couple of blog posts today by a young man on um, a blogging network called Science20. Um, and I'll link to this as well, of course, in the blog post, explaining why faster than light neutrinos don't necessarily break causality. And it's, you know, and it's not wormholes and they're not, you know, showing everything we know to be wrong. He, um, this is where the physics to some extent gets, well, into I'd have to discuss it for an hour kind of thing for it to make any sense. But but the idea that they can kind of zip into perhaps bulk dimensions around the dimensions we're used to and then zip back in, for example. Uh, so that's getting a lot of a lot of interest as well. <laughs> By the way, if you don't quite understand that analogy, Carl Sagan's got a wonderful analogy called uh, a flatland. Yeah. Um, if you if you want to try and wrap your head around how particles can travel through additional dimensions without us being able to actually see them. Mm. There's also um, a lovely movie called Flatland uh, based on a Victorian novel. Um, it's kind of a romantic satire written by a Victorian where he talks about um, a two-dimensional being and their experience in a three-dimensional world. It's also great good fun. <laughs> Quite entertaining indeed. <laughs> so we'll we'll keep watching these results. Um, 
just to see what happens. It's it's potentially very interesting. Whatever happens, there will be papers written about it. Um, there there is that feeling amongst the science fraternity of oh god, you know, if if this is really happening, this is going to overturn so much. Ooh, how exciting! <laughs> So I should also say before we move on to this next article that even if this result does uh, is shown to be right, and I very much hope that it is, um, that this does not mean that everything we know about life and light and time and causality is wrong. It just means that it is incomplete, very much like uh, Einstein's theories are an extension of Newton's theories of gravity. If this is shown to be right, all that it will require is, hopefully, an extension of Einstein's theories. Uh, rather than a complete rewrite. Indeed, and and that's likely to be the case. Einstein's theories have been so well backed up in experiment, there's very little chance that we are completely wrong. Yeah, but there could be a more subtle effect that we need to nut out. Mm, indeed. How exciting.